Good morning. Well, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever time of day you are participating with us in this worship, we welcome you. I've got five important announcements for the flock. We'll be posting these announcements on the website as well. Announcement number one, we won't be meeting at the building through April. Small groups are encouraged to stay in touch virtually, not in homes, through April as well. We have asked our small group leaders to offer the opportunity to get together within their own small groups online, just to pray together and check in on everybody. Announcement number two, we deeply appreciate those involved in putting together the worship service online. Uh, this is clearly no easy task and we find it very well done. A big thank you then goes out to Craig, Rod, and Aaron for their efforts. The most challenging part of this uh, service is the song service. Craig and Aaron have been the receiver of opinions on how the song should work. The elders understand their difficult task. We want to pass on to the flock that we believe they are doing the best they can and we support them in their efforts. It's still a process that we are all getting used to. And we need to practice patience, understanding, and grace during this time. Please direct your feedback on the worship service to the elder on call. That would be Bruce Blacketer over the next couple of weeks. That will lessen the load on those who are spending so much time to bring us a God-honoring worship in our homes. Announcement number three. The shepherds and ministers have been calling and, and chatting with people, but we, we may have missed somebody. This can be a time to really let our light shine. So please check on each other and don't hesitate to reach out to Rod if you see a need that we may be able to help address. Announcement number four. Please look at the status page frequently on our website for updates. Look for items marked new for the most recent updates. We are posting weekly Bible class material for the kiddos and a date and time for an online Devo for our teens. Also, on the members menu under bulletin and audio, you'll find the announcements each week that includes people and situations that we need to be praying for. Announcement number five, and finally, the elders have an important assignment for the flock. You'll find a link on the status page on the website today for this assignment. It is not a COVID-19 issue. The assignment has to do with the future of our education program. This was something we intended over a month ago to give you last Sunday. We believe it is still the right time to have you help us. So we'll need your help, and we trust that you will come through for us. Thanks for listening. Now let's continue our time together. Hello. Grace and peace in Jesus' name. We're in a different context here. We uh, see dryness and maybe almost barrenness, obviously lack of green. And uh, that might be a picture of what's going on in our hearts and minds maybe as we consider the difficult times we're in, entering into. It seems like it's going to get even worse. And so it seems like a good time then to remember who Jesus is, who God is, what his character is like, what he has done in the past. And we want to read Psalm 145 today as we prepare for our time of worship and uh, bear these words in mind not only for this time of worship but through this week and into the coming weeks when it might get a lot worse for us. We want to keep asking God for help and keep coming to Him and worship Him no matter what the circumstances are. So please read with me Psalm 145. A song of praise of David. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall, shall commend your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power. 
to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his works and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Almighty God, you are the giver of life and sustainer of life. We look to you during our good times, but also during our dry times. We want to trust you more. We know you're in control. We do confess our full dependence on you for all things. As we face a dry and barren time, much worse for some than for others, please help us to keep worshipping you, not as much for what you've done for us or given us, but because you are God. When we see you face to face one day, we will bow our heads and bend our knees before you in your presence. You are glorious and deserving of our worship always because you are God. We want to worship you with all our hearts and all our minds and all our souls and all our strength, no matter what our circumstances. Lord, we confess that simply stating this is far different from actually doing it when we're really struggling or facing ruin of some sort. And so we beg you to be patient with us when we fail. We beg you to spare us. Lord, you are able. You are mighty to save. Please rescue us. As we enter into this time of worship now, we want to do so to the best of our ability. May we find grace in our time of need. And thank you, Lord, that we can access your throne of grace now and at all times. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. Glad to be with you this morning. Sorry I couldn't be with you last week. Uh, but I hope the songs were uplifting to you and an inspiration and means to guide you throughout this week. Speaking of weeks, we seem to be in our fourth week. Uh, and during this time, I know I've learned some stuff about myself. Uh, hopefully you also have. Um, I'll be transparent and upfront and confess uh, to you. I touch my face way too much. Uh, that has really come out. <laughs> need to fix that. Uh, another thing that's been on my heart uh, is the subject of lament and also the struggle within my heart is lamenting. I um, actually came across an article this week by N.T. Wright that helps put into words what I'm trying to explain. Uh, so I'm going to just jump in the middle of his writing here. Suppose real human wisdom doesn't mean being able to string together some dodgy speculation. What if there are what if there are moments such as NTS Eliot recognized in the 40s when the only advice is to wait without hope because we'd be hoping for the wrong things. Rationalists, including Christian rationalists, want explanations. Romantics, including Christian romantics, want to be given a sigh of relief. But perhaps what we need more than either is to recover the biblical tradition of lament. Lament is what happens when people ask why and don't get an answer. At this point, the Psalms, the Bible's own hymn book, come back to their own just with some churches seem to have given them up. Be gracious to me, Lord, prays the sixth Psalm, for I am languishing, O Lord, heal me, for my bones are shaken with terror. Why do you stand far off, O Lord? Ask the 10th Psalm, Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? How long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? Psalm 13. Jesus himself quoted it in agony on the cross. My God, my God, 
why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22. Yes, these poems end with light's fresh sense of God's presence and hope. But sometimes they go the other way. Psalm 89 starts off by celebrating God's goodness and then declares that it's all gone horribly wrong. Psalm 88 starts in misery and ends in darkness. You have caused friend and neighbor to shun me. My companions are in darkness. A word for our self-isolated times. The point of lament is not just an outlet for frustration, sorrow, loneliness, and sheer inability to understand what is happening or why. The biblical story is that God also laments. Some Christians like to think of God as above all that, calm and unaffected by the troubles in this world. That's not the biblical picture we get in the Bible. God was grieved to his heart over the violent wickedness of human creatures. He was devastated when the people of Israel turned away from him. And the story of Jesus was meaningless, meaningless unless that's what it's about. He wept at the tomb of his friend. Paul speaks of the Holy Spirit groaning within us as we ourselves groan. It is no part of the Christian vocation then to be able to explain what is happening and why. In fact, it is part of the Christian vocation not to be able to explain and to lament instead. So the Spirit laments within us, so we become, even in ourselves, isolation, small shrines where the presence and the healing love of God can dwell. And out of that, there can emerge new possibilities, new acts of kindness, new scientific understanding, new hope new wisdom, and even new wisdom for our leaders. Now there's a thought. So I hope that touched you in some way, much like I hope these songs you're able to lament. But above all, we have hope because he gave us hope. We have assurance because he gave us assurance. And I hope that helps you throughout this week. God bless. I cannot wait to be back with you.
My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. So teach my song to rise to you. Temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I'll call on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay, and when I cannot stand, I'll call on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, oh, God, how I need you. You're my one. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Jesus calls himself the bread of life. In response to Satan's temptation to turn stones into bread, Jesus says that man shall not live on bread alone but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We do well to remember Jesus' example, to return to the word, the life-giving word, and to base our whole lives on that, all our responses, no matter what temptations we face, no matter what is going on. As our bodies need bread to survive, so our souls need the bread of life to live forever. And we're so grateful that Jesus has made it possible for us to be saved. As we then partake of these symbols this morning again and remember the body of Christ and the blood of Christ, we do so remembering that the sacrifice came at a great price. When Jesus calls himself the bread that was sent from heaven in John 6, he does that in the context of relationship. He talks about his body being true food and his blood bring, being true drink. And that's in the context of relationship, knowing God. When we eat his body and drink his blood, we have relationship with him. But there's a connection clearly to the Lord's Supper, to the bread of life, the body of Christ given on the cross, the blood of Christ that flowed to forgive us of our sins. And these are the things we remember now. And without forgetting that our whole lives, not just this remembrance time, but every day, should keep going back to the Word of God, the Word of life. Thank you, Almighty God, for the bread of life, the words that give life, and Jesus, the Savior. May our participation in remembering the body of Christ be life-giving and life-changing for us to live worthy of this sacrifice. 
We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for taking away our sin. The fruit of the vine is easy for us to drink, but the cup you drank in our place was terrible. Thank you, Lord. Please continue to remind us how to live so that we can honor you with our lives. We owe you our lives, all we have and are. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to imagine that you're watching a boxing match on TV. And the boxing match includes a guy named Tyson Fury. Now, if you're not familiar with Tyson Fury, he is a heavyweight boxer who has had 31 matches, 30 of which he's won, 21 by knockout. And so if you are watching Tyson Fury, do you think somewhere along the way, you might get the sense or begin to think, oh, I could totally beat this guy. I bet if I paid attention to his, his moves, I watched how his jabs worked, and I saw how he misdirected his punches, I could probably get in the ring and beat this guy. Now, I hope you're not thinking that. If you were, I think you'd be sorely mistaken. In fact, I think this story would prove that or illustrate that. There was a guy named Shane. He was in his late 20s, decided that to get in shape, he would do some boxing. A friend of his owned a gym, and so they would go down there and they would work away at learning some basics of boxing. Two months into it, Shane decided he was ready to spar. Now, sparring is getting into the ring, and it's not a real match. Everybody's punching at about 50% of their normal power. Now, by the way, I would take it very personally if you thought I had to Google this information, that, that a person like me wouldn't just naturally know all of that. But, but back to the story. Um, Shane says he's ready to spar with someone, but the only other person in the gym is a guy named Tony. And Tony is a Golden Gloves featherweight winner. And so the trainer tries to tell Shane, no, there's no way you could beat Tony in a boxing match. But Shane knows he's 100 pounds heavier than Tony, and so he says he can do it. So they get into the ring and they begin to spar. If you were to ask Shane, how did it go? best Shane could do is shrug his shoulders. The very first punch that Tony threw knocked Shane out cold. See, when it comes to battles and to fights, we need to be aware of what we can and what we cannot do. This morning, we're going to approach the temptations with the understanding that Jesus is our representative champion in the ring. I mean, there's no way that we're ever going to be able to get in the ring against the devil and knock him out unless Jesus has first done that. Jesus can, after he is our champion, he can serve as our coach, but first we need to know and be reminded that Jesus has won the wilderness victory on our behalf. What we witness in the temptation is a cosmic rumble in the jungle between mankind and the devil. Now, if you were to look at the beginning of your Bible, you would see the first recorded confrontation between mankind and the devil, and that was in the garden. There, mankind was represented by Adam and Eve, and there was a confrontation. But notice that when Adam and Eve first face the devil, they were enjoying the richness of the garden. They were prepared physically. They were strong, and there was just plenty and fullness all around them. And yet, even in the best of context, those representing mankind were not faithful to their God. So that begs the question, what makes any of us think that we're going to be able to enter into a time of testing 
What makes any of us think that we're going to be able to live in the wilderness and come out of that without being knocked out? The answer, of course, comes by reading the temptations and understanding Jesus as our representative champion. Now, to help illustrate this concept of a representative champion, maybe we can go to one of the best known stories in scripture, the story of David and Goliath. And and that will help us understand this concept. So if you remember, Goliath would go out to the very edge of the mountainside and he would come as he would appear. Of course, he's, he's a huge, tall guy. And he would be covered from head to toe in all of this protective gear. And he would stand out there in the presence of the Israelites. And he would yell at them, choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. This is a representative battle. Essentially, they're each saying, pick your fittest, strongest, most capable warrior, and he will face our fittest, strongest, most capable warrior, and whoever wins will let the armies know which is the more powerful. If our strongest person can be your strongest person, then we know that our army could be your army. So in some ways, this notion of a representative champion is strange to us, but in many ways, we're perfectly comfortable with the idea. Think about the cross. On the cross, we understand that Jesus died in our place. By his wounds, we have been healed. So our righteous standing before God is on the basis of what Jesus has done as a representative for all of humanity. So I think as we read the temptations, we read it by realizing Jesus is representing us there. He is going into the wilderness on our behalf. But if he is going to represent humanity in the desert, then he has to do that as a human being. Remember last week we learned from Luke 3 that Jesus is first of all God's son, but he is also a son of Adam. So the question is, how is Jesus going to approach the temptations? Will he do so on the basis of being God's son or on the basis of being a son of Adam? And what the first temptation highlights is the humanity of Jesus. He does not eat, he is hungry, and he is tempted to turn a stone into bread. So the temptation is for Jesus to access or utilize his humanity. So if he does that, he reaches into his humanity, he will no longer be enduring the temptations as a man, and thus he can no longer represent mankind as they deal with these evil forces. Maybe one way to think about it is to imagine these two guys who are roommates, John and Sam. But before long, it becomes pretty evident that their backgrounds are completely different. John, the son of a billionaire, Sam growing up in low-income housing. And it's their wealth that becomes this issue for them. And Sam claims that as long as John has his dad's credit card and access to all of his dad's resources, he will never understand what it's like to be him. But the question would be then, would John be willing to give up access to all of those things in an effort to identify with Sam? See, if you think about Jesus in his deity, we could ask the question, how would deity respond to these temptations? Well, first of all, we know that God doesn't hunger. And, and so the fact that Jesus hungers shows that he is having a human experience. And so as he has these human experiences, will he handle them or deal with them in human ways? And therefore he can represent humanity, or is he gonna reach over into his divinity and essentially cheat or essentially use his father's credit card taking advantage of what it means to be the Son of God. See, when Jesus is tempted to turn the stone into bread, he is tempted in something that in many ways we are not tempted with. But what, Jesus, what Satan is trying to get Jesus to do, the core of the temptation is about Jesus claiming his uniqueness and accessing his divinity in such a way that we can no longer relate to him and in such a way that he can no longer serve as our human representative. Jesus is invited to do something that we cannot do. 
And the question becomes, will he? Because if he does, humanity will in many ways, whether God allows it or not, humanity would reject him as our representative. Because we would say he, he could not possibly understand our struggles, our temptations, our battles. He doesn't know what it's like to live in the wilderness as a human being. But of course, we know that Jesus does represent humanity because he's faithful in his full humanity in his wilderness times. That's why the author of Hebrews says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet is without sin. This cosmic rumble in the jungle, it's not just Jesus versus the devil, but it's mankind represented through Jesus versus the devil. His loss would be our loss, and his victory would be our victory. Jesus is in the one corner representing humanity, and in the other corner is the devil. And as the gospel writers describe him, the devil has authority over the kingdoms of this world. He says of that authority that it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. Now, some people think that the devil is just claiming to have this authority, but we all know that he really doesn't. But wouldn't Jesus be smart enough to pick up on that? Wouldn't Jesus just simply say, you can't offer me that? How much of a temptation is there in someone promising to do something that they have no access to do? If I told you to do something, and if you did it, I would give you a million bucks, and you knew I didn't have a million dollars, there's likely no temptation involved in that. Satan is presented as one who has certain power and certain authority. And so what Jesus needs to do is he needs to somehow address that. He needs to go face to face with the devil because the devil is like Tyson Fury in the ring. And there's no way we can even begin to get into the ring unless Jesus does something first. That's why in Luke 11, where Jesus is accused of casting out demons in or by the power of Satan, he says in response, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his castle, his property is safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his plunder. So the devil is the strong man and Jesus is the stronger one. And Jesus will overpower him, and then he can divide his plunder. What is the plunder? The plunder is all the rewards, all, all the benefits of the victory. So who is Jesus dividing it with? He is sharing the plunder with humanity. So in the desert, Jesus represents humanity. But Jesus also will retrace the steps of Israel. And where Israel was unfaithful, Jesus will show his own faithfulness. See, when we read about Luke and the temptation, we begin to hear these echoes of something that sounds very familiar. Because in Luke 4, 1 and in Deuteronomy 8, 2, there's four words that are the exact same word. Led, 40, wilderness, and testing. That's no coincidence that there's an echo. See, where Adam failed, Jesus succeeds. Where Israel failed, Jesus succeeds. See, the good news is that Jesus has begun to deliver that first blow to Satan on our behalf. He is beginning to cripple all that is evil and all that is wicked. It's our victory. I, I'm kind of a casual sports fan. So I, don't, I don't tend to watch a lot of sports until there's you know, a big thing, a Super Bowl or some sort of a larger uh, event like that. So as the skeptic in me watches people whose teams win and they'll jump up and down and they'll say, we won, we won, we won. And I'm thinking, you didn't win. You didn't do anything there. But in the very same way, as Christ remains faithful in the temptations, that does become our victory. So as Christ is winning here, we can say, we win, we win, we win. We know that every wilderness season that we enter thereafter, we enter knowing that we have a champion who has gone before us. So that when we are weak, he is strong on our behalf. 
And Jesus does know that we will be tempted and that we will be tried. He knows that we will also have to enter into the wilderness. And so Jesus, who is the champion, can now look to us and begin to be our coach and to teach us how to enter into the wilderness and enter into temptation in a way that's different than Adam and Eve and in a way that's different than Israel so we too can be faithful in our own wilderness experience. So what can we learn from Jesus as we think about our own wilderness experiences? It was Timothy Keller who pointed out that the temptation is not merely a beha- about behavioral compliance. Jesus is not just teaching us how to be good little boys and good little girls. Jesus is teaching us about a particular attitude and relationship to God. In other words, what's being revealed is not just the right way to behave, but it's about the right way to view God that's going to lead to the right kind of living. And when you return to that first temptation of mankind, of Adam, you're going to find that that's the core difference, is how Jesus and Adam viewed God. See, in the garden, God simply said, do not eat the fruit of this tree. But God doesn't explain why or all the reasons. He simply calls Adam and Eve to love him and to trust him. But then the serpent comes in and says, did God really say that that you shouldn't eat from any tree in the garden? And the focus, of course, is on the restrictiveness of God. Satan is trying to undermine the nature of God. So Satan is painting a picture of a God who is restrictive, self-absorbed, and selfish. See, the temptation is an assault on God's generosity. And because of that, if God is not good and God is not generous, then you cannot trust in God to provide. You have to take, like Adam and Eve did, you take matters into your own hand. Jesus, on the other hand, he believed in God's goodness. He believed that God would provide. And so he trusted him in that time. What we need most in the wilderness is active trust in the goodness of God. We need a belief that God can and will provide everything that he's promised. I believe we're in a wilderness season. And I believe that Jesus has things that he can teach us and coach us with as we find ourselves in the wilderness. Romans 1.25 says of those who turned away from God that they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And I think we have to be really aware in the wilderness about what the lies are and what the truth is. And I think there's especially two forms that we're going to experience lies right now. The first lie is that God isn't good. Are we believing this lie about God? I mean, the question that is at stake in our time is, can God be trusted to provide what is needed? Or or do I have to take matters into my own hand? Can you lean on God, or are you afraid he's going to move and let you fall? Can you rest in God, or are you uncertain that God is going to be continuing to work while you rest? See, if God is not good, and God is not generous, and God is not for us, how does one come to have anything good in their life? Satan's answer is you have to take control. You have to fix it. You have to assert your own independence because Satan wants to move us away from trusting in God at this time. The second way I think that we will experience lies is that God is only good if, and then fill in the blank about what God might do, See, what this lie does is it tests us to confuse trusting and testing. I think that there's a lot of Christians out there who are professing trust, but really are displaying an attitude of practicing a lifestyle that looks more like testing. See, see, testing is telling God that if he really is God, he will show up in all the ways that we prescribe and in all the ways that we demand and at the time that we say he needs to do it. So someone testing God might say, We're going to continue meeting together as a church, and we know we won't get sick. And when we don't get sick, that's going to be a testimony to you of how good God is, that God didn't let it happen. Or someone trusting who is testing God might say, well, I lost my job, 
but I'm not going to do anything about it because I'm just going to wait for God to show his goodness by giving me another job. Or someone testing God might say, God will be sure that by May 1st, all of this is over. Trusting God in the wilderness means we often live with more questions than answers. How long is this going to last? What's going to be the economic impact? Am I going to lose my job? Am I going to get sick? Is everyone in my family going to survive? Testing says, here's all the answers to those questions, but trusting says, God is good. And I'm going to trust him with all my questions. A person trusting God doesn't need answers to all those questions because they know that the wilderness is the place where there are more questions than answers. See, this week my encouragement to you is to humbly and faithfully live with all of those questions, to to recognize that this is a wilderness experience, that the things that we can know is that God is good and that we can indeed trust him. No, you're not going to have all the answers to your questions. But here's what we do know. Jesus, our champion, has defeated the evil one. Yes, the evil one continues to work in certain ways. God wills and allows that. But Jesus has thrown already the knockout punch. And the second thing that we realize is that God is worthy of our trust because he is good. Live into the questions. Trust God. We'd also like to keep reminding folks to give. The ongoing needs of the congregation, of course, don't uh, just stop because we're not meeting in the uh, building. But apart from that, the need is clearly going to increase for a lot of people within the church and also outside of the church with people having less work, earning less income. Needs are really going to increase. And so we're reminded, for instance, of Ephesians 4, uh, where we're told to keep working and to be uh, hardworking contributors to those who have need. Since that is going to be increasing, we want to keep uh, that in mind and, and be faithful in God's hands to take care of each other. First, the household of God, but also outside. So please uh, consider that. You can give... Um, via check at the P.O. Box address, or you could contribute online. Those options are both available. As we close this morning, I'd like to encourage everyone to spend time this week in God's Word and in prayer. We'll have a scripture, then our prayer. Our scripture this morning is from the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand key for us to remember in these times is God is our God and he has us in his right hand. Let's pray together. Dear God, we, we ask you to bless us. We, we ask you to help us through these difficult times and please heal our broken world. Heal it spiritually and physically. Please provide us comfort and peace as we acknowledge you are in control and bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll be online again next week and we hope you can follow us then. Till then, God bless you. Goodbye. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. 
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.